The year was 1974. Rockwell just started construction of the first space shuttle, Enterprise. George Lucas was writing script for the Star Wars. Meanwhile, India became the sixth nation to test its own nuclear weapon. In Hungary, architecture professor Erna Rubik have invented one and only Rubik's Cube puzzle toy. In the Soviet Union, Enpo Energia was designing a new fleet of various heavy lift rockets. Moon race have concluded, and both superpowers were planning on building large orbital stations and maybe even launching crewed missions to Mars. More than a decade later, world would see not only regular flights of American space shuttle, but the first flight of very similar Soviet space plane Buran. And while in the end parity in the space launch system have been achieved, their original development plans was way more interesting and different from each other. Space Shuttle was intended as way smaller vehicle, launched horizontally from a flying platform. Payload capacity had been relatively small, and the main function of the craft was to deliver crew and cargo to a space station. On the other side of the ocean, initial ideas was way bigger in the scope. This was due to the reality where the Space Shuttle design was almost finalized in 1974. Soviets were in desperate need to match military potential of new American orbiter. With failure of N-1 moon rockets, Soviets were short of heavy lift rocket capable to launch such a heavy orbiter as Space Shuttle. So the new heavy lift rocket family was planned as delivery system for everything including big crude orbiters. By 1975, NPO Energia had came up with two competing designs for orbiter vehicle itself. First one was MTKVP, which is in Russian Nagarazovy Transportny Karabel Vertikalny Posadki, and that can be translated in English as Reusable Vertical Landing Transport Ship. This was a 34-meter-long lifting body spaceship launched on top of a stack of kerosene fueled strap-on boosters. Second design was named in Russian OS-120 or Orbitalny Samolot 120, which is in English is Orbital Space Plane 120, where 120 stands for 120 ton of the space plane. A relatively close copy of US space shuttle composed of a delta wing space plane, equipped with three liquid hydrogen engines, strapped to a detachable external tank and four liquid fuel boosters. While both 1975 designs were still far away from final form of Buran, groundwork was in place. In the end, the ultimate winner was the second and more militaristic design to match space shuttle potential. On the other hand, the first design idea had its own benefits. If you think, this is the only spacecraft that ever was designed in similar fashion to a modern SpaceX Starship. And even when you watch documentaries in Russian about the Buran itself, people still go for this journalistic wow effect of Soviet copycat space shuttle. They doesn't cover the first design and they doesn't cover three iterations of Buran energy system. But still, we have enough source materials from the books. Thanks to that, we can get concrete picture about first iteration of the Soviet orbiter design. A reusable vertical landing transport ship was resembling a modern SpaceX Starship. Well, in reality of 1970s computer technology. Nobody was planning on belly flop landings under pure engine power. By this design, Orbiter was a cylindrical lifting body spacecraft with a pair of stern flaps to control re-entry, which is basically the whole idea behind the modern Starship. Horizontal range of this system was rather limited compared to a space plane. Range the angle was way higher than that of a space shuttle, and heat shield should have been refurbished, not reused, which was deemed too expensive by the Soviet engineers compared to idea of reusable space shuttle. Which is kind of startling to know, since even the space shuttle ended up as a refurbished vehicle, not really a reusable one. Main benefits of this system was ability to place orbiter on top of the heavy lift rocket. Vertical placement of orbiter streamlined the assembly for the launch and made the whole system easy to balance along the main central axis. Second benefit of this design was an ability to place main engines not an orbiter, but at the bottom of the main oxygen-hydrogen tank. This alone was very beneficial idea making orbiter and lifting rockets independent systems. After Challenger and Columbia disaster, Americans also considered turning space transportation system into an independent heavy launch vehicle. But in the end, only Buran Energia was able to achieve this brilliant flexibility way back in 1988. On the other hand, reusable vertical line and transport ship went through couple iterations itself even before 1975. If the idea was to be greenlit, it could have seen its first test flight as early as 1980. Well, quite optimistic. I would say even Soviet optimistic. But considering the simplified nature of this design, maybe even realistic. To increase horizontal range of orbiter, lifting body surface was increased, enabling it to house landing slats, servers for flaps, and various engines. Extensive parachute system was planned to reduce vertical speed while landing an orbiter. For the most part, this became possible after successful development of various military parachute systems to power drop tanks, artillery, and other heavy payloads from the military planes. At the altitude of 12 kilometers, 
Orbiter would partially deploy its chutes and then fully deploy them at an altitude of 4 km. But even that was not enough to land safely. Two stage landing engines were proposed for the final part of the descent. And finally, during the touchdown, slats were ideal to kill any parasitic horizontal speed. As one can imagine, benefits of this landing approach was immense. No need to build and maintain expensive and long runways. Especially in the places like Central Asia, where their practical application was rather questionable. And considering the size of the Soviet Union, ability to land pretty much anywhere was quite important. Other design feature of this orbiter was ability to duplicate several systems streamlining in the production. Orbital maneuvering engines and RCS were to be placed into a very similar conic bow and stern. Cargo payload could vary from the mission to mission, and vertical placement of orbiter opened ability to use more than four boosters. The launch system of choice was pretty much early version of Energia rocket with several key differences. The project name for this system was Vulcan. Vulcan utilized twice the number of boosters to launch even heavier payloads than Energia. Eight boosters coupled in pairs was enough to launch around 200 tons, which is twice the size of the Energia payload. On the other hand, Orbiter was planned to replace Soyuz as the main crew delivery system. And thanks to flexibility of launch system, Vulcan can use only two boosters for pure crewed missions with minimal cargo payloads. There is simply no information on crew complement of this Orbiter, but we can assume something similar to 10 seats that of a Buran or maybe 7 seats that of a space shuttle. Considering that Buran was designed with 10 ejection seats to safeguard the crew, this system probably would have some sort of crew escape system as well. One can even imagine conic bow of the ship being independent crew escape vehicle, just like on the proposed Space Shuttle Block 2. As we can only guess, but what we know for sure that this project was not totally scrapped in the favor of Buran. Numerous ideas have made into the final design of Buran Energia system. For example, Energia side boosters utilize numerous recovery systems designed for a usable vertical line and transport ship. Yes, those bizarre shaped boosters of Energia house parachutes and landing gear developed first for the MTKVP. But a good question is, as always, what if MTKVP was a real deal? Is it even a workable idea? And well, we have Kerbal Space Program to test this concept. We can see how good or bad was the Soviet logic behind this awesome design. Here's a similar design orbiter with corresponding launch system. And to test its metal, I have decided on building a space station. Interesting thing about the whole Vulcan and Tekoape utilization is the payload potential. Space Shuttle and Buran both launched only 29 and 30 ton payloads. Projected mass of fueled MTKVP was to be around 88 tons. Payload was designed to be 30 tons as well, which is only 118 tons. But then there is the big question about 200 ton projected payload of Vulcan. Energia was launching only 105 tons of Buran with its payload. And Space Shuttle was even lighter vehicle with shorter orbital range that of Buran. Numbers just does not add up which is pretty normal for a paper project and concept ideas. What we know for sure that Buran and Space Shuttle are lighter even with the extensive wing system absent from MTKVP. So one can totally expect MTKVP to lift way heavier and bulkier payloads on top of full 8 booster Vulcan. So with this in mind, I have decided to build something a bit bigger with my Kerbal Space Program replica. So I decided to build uh, something similar to Tiangdong Space Station. While modules of Chinese Space Station is a bit bigger, that of ISS or Mir, they weigh around the same 22 plus tons, similar to a Soviet Space Station modules like core module of Mir or core module of ISS, which is Zarya. Tiangong Space Station is a remarkable continuation of Mir Space Station design. Station is built in three launches, and initial docking is achieved through single docking port. After initial docking, robotic arm take newly docked module and reposition into the side docking nodes. One thing that I noticed during initial test of this launch system is the problems with low atmosphere instability. While in reality orbiter have no wing area to interfere, KSP is just wired a bit differently. The whole benefit of wingless orbiter is to remove parasitic drag and lift during launch, while KSP wing parts just apply drag and lift in any way, shape and form. So I was forced to add extra fins to main core stage of the launch system to prevent uncontrolled flipping. First launch was not the most exemplary mission, but nevertheless 100% successful. Deployed the first model of a space station at the altitude above 300 km. Actually experimented with a steep angle of re-entry, however it forced me into a cargo bay braking to save my top fins from overheating. But if one use steeper angle of re-entry, top fins can easily survive the re-entry hit. Good thing about this ship is ability to maneuver and fine-tune landing spot even when parachutes are deployed. Real thing was designed with two stage landing engines, I just used one stage. And overall, 
it gets the job done. Compared to ordinary shuttle landing, this orbiter landing approach is just piece of cake. Craft is balanced, and you can steer to a flat landing spot and just fire up the engines at the last 10 or 20 seconds. Second and third launches were quite ordinary. The whole launch system is total overkill if you launch only 20 tons of station module. At first I really wanted to play around with number of boosters, but honestly for me it's more about orbital vehicle, testing it, not the launch system itself, launch system is just, well, you know, big dumb rocket with boosters and that's it. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the real-life Chinese space station that I kinda trying to recreate to some extent is armed with actually six robotic arms, and here I have tried to use only one to simply redock two modules, and once again I kinda stumbled upon the wackiness of whole vanilla robotics. They kind of fine until the point where you encounter some bizarre behavior. So after manipulating with bendy arm for like 20 minutes, I have went for a normal docking procedures. Highlight of this space station are the solar panels and their deployment. When deployed, main solar panel array is somewhat similar to ISS solar panels and their tracking capability. But on the other hand, ISS panels were attached as the separate modules. While well, this station have solar panels integrated with two main modules. Solar panels just deploy in similar fashion to other well-known space station Skylab, just on a way bigger scale. Returning both orbiters was as, as easy as the first time. Although those two top fins are definitely not the best fit for the atmospheric re-entry. While I was flying these three missions to test the orbiter, I had an idea. So we all know that Starship design is not only dependent on its re-entry capability in Earth atmosphere, our whole Skydiver concept works well with the Mars as well. So what if I take my replica and try it to land on Duna? It definitely have the Delta V to get there, and cargo bay can carry return vehicle or maybe even simple refinery. While shoots are not so effective as on curving, those landing engines have better TVR in Duna gravity and this is more than enough to land. Although landing engines are not entirely balanced, this is more of a fine-tuning issue than the deal breaker. And as you can see, I have totally nailed the landing. And just the whole ease of piloting for this craft made me a real fan of this design concept. It definitely works, and definitely looking forward to make something similar in KSP2. But until then, check out my other KSP videos and have a great day!